Excellencies, ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. What a pleasure it is to see all of you here today for the 10th Geneva Security Debate. The Geneva Security Debates consist of public discussions on current security challenges. Each month we unite the world's leading thinkers and practitioners for interactive discussions. In the short run, we hope that these Geneva security debates will inform our policymakers here in Geneva, but also in the world uh, outside of Geneva. And in the long run, we hope that these debates will help us to shape a better global future together. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Christina Shori Liang. I'm from the Geneva Center for Security Policy, where I work on terrorism and prevent preventing violent extremism. I'm also a visiting professor at Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences Po. Let me introduce my panelists, Dr. Sandeep Waslerkar and Ambassador Thomas Greminger. Let me first begin with Ambassador Thomas Greminger. Ambassador Thomas Greminger served as the Secretary General of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe from July 2017 to July 2020. And as May 21st, he took over as the Director of the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And we're delighted to have him here. As OSCE's Secretary General, Ambassador Greminger acted as an effective crisis manager and promoted dialogue among the 57 OSC participating states as one of his key priorities. He supported the OSCE in field presence and in preventing or managing conflicts. Ambassador Greminger also promoted effective multilateralism by strengthening ties with the OSCE partners among international and regional organizations. Before working at the OSCE, Ambassador Greminger served as permanent representative of Switzerland to the OSC and the United Nations and international organizations in Vienna. He was instrumental in devising consecutive chairmanships and joint work plans and was responsible for preparing the successful 2014 OSC Ministerial Council in Basel. Dr. Sandeep Westlecker, he is president and founder of the Strategic Foresight Group, a think tank based in Mumbai, India, that advises governments and institutions around the world on how to manage future challenges. Under his leadership, the SFG has worked with 65 countries over four continents, creating new policy concepts for con conflict resolution and foresight for countries and societies. He also facilitated dialogue between Indian and Pakistani decision makers, heads of Nepalese political parties, and water authorities in Africa and the Middle East. Dr. Sandeep read philosophy, politics, and economics at St. John's College at Oxford and was conferred the honoris causa of symbiosis International University by the President of India in 2011. I'm very impressed by both of your very diverse and, and important uh, uh, contributions uh, to global peace. But now I think we should turn to the, 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 the focus of this uh, debate today. And this is the, your book, Dr. Sandeep um, Wasakar, on a world without war. And I think we've, we've put it here for you all to see. And I believe there are some copies for you uh, later that we can uh, share um, perhaps uh, with some of you. <laughs> um, so, Ambassador Greminger, I'd like to start with you. Why do you think um, Dr. Sandeep Wasakar's book uh, is a seminal work that needs to be urgently read by the global community, and most especially its global leaders? Well, the short answer is because uh, we live in a very gloomy time. Um, I think uh, I think uh, Sandy's book is very timely, and and I appreciate uh, his main messages uh, uh, exactly because you know we just come out of a major pandemic, uh, we face enormous uh, uh, challenges uh, to peace and security on the globe. Uh, uh, among them, you know, the, the, the climate change. We are currently witnessing a major war uh, in Europe. Uh, the nuclear threat that, you know, basically that came off the, the political mainstream has come back. It's again very much at the forefront of um, the, the political uh, discourse. Uh, we are. Uh, 
witnessing uh, um, also a concrete case of, of nuclear coercion uh, uh, right now. Um, and I think, uh, particularly in the Euro-Atlantic Euro uh, and Eurasian uh, area, uh, people mainly perceive these days uh, uh, security uh, through deterrence. I think that's the, the, the mainstream uh, perception. While, you know, uh, reflecting uh, about how to achieve a sustainable peace uh, is, uh, I think, is quite marginal. And, and uh, there is uh, this uh, undertaking by the UN Secretary General uh, to come up with a new agenda for peace. And as a matter of fact, I will have to leave uh, at two <laughs> sharp <laughs> because there is this afternoon uh, a very important consultation between Geneva and New York on the new agenda for peace. Um, but I'm afraid this is very much an uphill, uh, a political uphill battle. It's in uh, happening, it's an exercise that is happening in, in, in very uh, complicated uh, circumstances. And yeah, to cut a long story short, this is why I think it's great and, and very timely to be confronted with a radically different vision, uh, a, a vision uh, of a world without war. And in a way, you know, it's almost provocative, the title uh, of your book, uh, Under Current Circumstances. But I think that's, uh, that's what I like about it. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Wasakar, you explained in your book that this book is really a moral imperative. Could you kindly elaborate what, you, what led you to write this book and what role it should and hopefully will play in the global security landscape? Well, thank you, Christina, and thank you, GCSP, for hosting the discussion. In June 2019, a group of Nobel laureates uh, got together along with a couple of us in Normandy in France. Mohamed El Bardai, Jody Williams, Denis Mukwege, Lena Gobi, these were the Nobel Peace Laureates. And the occasion was the 75th anniversary of the Normandy landing, which those who are familiar with history know eventually led to the end of the Second World War. So for six months, I was negotiating a manifesto which was issued at the end of this meeting with the Nobel Peace Laureates, which, was, which is now known as the Normandy Manifesto for World Peace. And for six months, I was on a daily, almost hourly basis, negotiating the text of the manifesto with, with uh, Dr. El Bardai, uh, Jody Williams, and others. And in the course of these discussions, I realized that <coughs> We are really close to, we as humanity, we are really close to universal death. We may any time sleepwalk into a world war, either by accident or by incident or by intent. And mind you, I'm talking about early 2019, not early 2022 three years before the Ukraine war. And it was very clear looking at the way the world was going. So we issued this manifesto with a view to sensitize the world about the dangers that we are facing. And this danger we are facing because uh, at the end of the Cold War, which was supposed to be a dangerous epoch in the uh, history of humanity, your global military expenditure was $1 trillion. It is now $2 trillion. It has doubled. You have 10,000 nuclear warheads. And out of them, 2,800 on hair trigger alert, which means within 10 minutes of a decision taken by the president of the Russian Federation or president of the United States, missiles will go. And within 10 minutes or 15 minutes, they will hit their targets. And this project of human civilization, which has been evolving for the last 12,000 years, will be over in 12 hours. If you have a shower of missiles uh, from both sides with nuclear payload. So we are really living in the most dangerous epoch in, our, in the history of our species. 
And this is happening not only because of uh, hotspots like Ukraine, uh, North Korea, maybe some situation that could happen in Taiwan Strait or anywhere else in the world. This is also happening because of the growing uh, proximity or blending of artificial intelligence and other technologies with nuclear weapons. So we are on a dangerous path. We are going towards precipice. And we have to pull back, and that's a moral imperative. If you don't pull back from the precipice, this, this project of human civilization will be over. Humanity will be over. And, and it is our moral responsibility of everybody, of every leader, of every father, of every mother, of every child, to pull back from this precipice. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I just also wanted to pass now the floor to Ambassador Greminger. You have seen how passionate uh, Dr. Sandeep Vasakar is about this topic. And, and you also think, do you also think that we basically, luck has kept us from, from mutual annihilation to this point that we are now? And how do you feel that, or how do you think we can change our mental frameworks, uh, especially about new technologies and philosophies? And, and how, what are, what are your, your wise words on this? <laughs> My wise words on this. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, the, 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 the paradigm uh, that, uh, you know, dominates the, the, the logic uh, of nuclear arms use is, is, is mad. <laughs> and I, I think uh, mad is, in a way, uh, a mad. Uh, mad is stands for mutually assured destruction. And, uh, you know, one can argue that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, where we indeed uh, stood at the brink of a, a nuclear war, uh, we went uh, then down the path of um, arms control, right? And uh, I would argue that this path has provided us with um, certain strategic stability. It has uh, always left us with a, a residual uh, risk, so, um, but it has uh, brought about some uh, strategic stability. But I think what is worrisome uh, is A, there re remains this residual uh, risk, risk, and uh, what is even more worrisome, uh, that we have a, a number of uh, developments, uh, some rather recent, some uh, are rather long-term uh, uh, trends, that undermine the stabilizing uh, factors of this logic. And um, one is, of course, the steady erosion of this arms control regime that uh, uh, um, uh, had been built up uh, over, over many years. Um, I mean, we can uh, dig a bit deeper into that uh, later if you want. Um, then, uh, of course, the world has basically mad, was very much conceived to uh, be a system working in a bipolar uh, world. The world has become much more uh, complex, more complicated. You have at least nine uh, nuclear weapon states uh, today. Um, then uh, I think uh, what one should also not underestimate, and, and here the war uh, was, was clearly uh, an accelerator, um, <coughs> uh, communication channels between uh, key uh, actors have been lately very strained. Uh, many have disappeared. Dialogue has turned sour. Uh, and this, of course, uh, increases the risk of uh, misunderstandings uh, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, accidents. And then uh, Sandeep has just alluded to, there are these technological uh, developments. And I think uh, uh, they're clearly of concern. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, AI uh, uh, has been uh, mentioned. Uh, and I think uh, AI basically uh, implying that you have much shorter reaction times. Uh, you uh, also have more vulnerabilities for nuclear command and control centers. And, uh, and, and frankly, what we are currently seeing, uh, P5 states, they seem to acknowledge that there is uh, this risk of emerging technologies, but clearly they haven't uh, been factoring uh, uh, these risks into, for instance, risk reduction measures, at least not uh, as far as we know. 
Thank you so much. And you also mentioned um, in your book, um, Dr. Westlickard, about how there's basically an arms race and it's just getting worse and worse and you just elaborated it before, especially when you talked about um, biological, nuclear, and now even chemical and of course lethal autonomous weapons. Um, how, how what, what, what do you feel that we could do to, to stop this from, from continuing to spread and, and how can we get back on, on the negotiating table on arms control negotiations? Well, first of all, we have to, first of all, we have to uh, recognize that there is a cataclysmic arms race taking place. If you don't recognize that a problem exists, you will not look for a solution. So in order to find a solution, we must first accept that there is a problem. Like the younger uh, people in Europe particularly, but even in other parts of the world, they have recognized that there is a problem of climate change. And we see a response to that recognition through mass demonstrations and pressure on the government. But there doesn't seem to be a global awareness of the implications of the lethal arms race. So first of all, we have to recognize that there is a problem and that that awareness has to be built, that there is an arms race and this arms race could be suicidal, that, that this arms race with, which includes nuclear weapons, biological weapons, uh, lethal autonomous weapons, uh, hypersonic missiles, this can lead to a col collective suicide of humanity. So that is the first thing that we have to recognize. Second, we have to look for solutions. We have to build, uh, build uh, a momentum in support of phased elimination in a time-bound manner of all weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear, biological, chemical, lethal autonomous, uh, hypersonic, all weapons of mass destruction should be eliminated in a phased manner and in a time-bound manner. And we have to build a momentum for a global regime for this kind of a phased elimination of weapons of mass destruction. You already have a commitment of the nuclear weapon states, the recognized nuclear weapon states under Article 6 of NPT, that they will roll back and they will move towards a nuclear free world. This is a commitment they have made, but there is no implementation of this commitment. So we have to create public pressure for the implementation of this commitment. You have TPNW, you have the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and it has been uh, endorsed by 122 countries, but uh, uh, the nuclear weapon states and their allies have been out. So, so, so we have to uh, 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 force countries to fulfill their obligations which are already there under Article 6 of NPT and, and, and other. Third, we should start thinking and GCSP and Strategic Foresight Group and all other think tanks which are here in terms of a new regime for preventing the misuse of advanced technologies or the emerging technologies for in, in accelerating weapons of mass destruction or enabling weapons of mass destruction. The advanced technologies or the emerging technologies like AI, hypersonic, uh, cyber technologies, uh, there must be a regime to, to prevent the misuse of these technologies. See, technology, science and technology is developed by human beings for the welfare of humanity. Nobody goes and develops science and technology for destruction of humanity. Uh, but then we always see that some people come and they want to use a very good invention which has been uh, 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 brought into the world, brought into the planet for, for the goodness of human, humanity. They turn it around and they use it for destruction. Take a simple example of an aeroplane. In 1903, Wilbur and Orville Wright uh, had the first flight of uh, aeroplane, and their purpose was not to make bombers. Their purpose was to enable people to cross continents, to fly like a bird, and a lot of people uh, used to think uh, at the end of last century, the previous century, you know, how can I fly like a bird? So they created a bird, which is the aeroplane. But already by 1913, within 10 years, aeroplanes were used for, uh, for bombing innocent civilians. Same thing with chlorine. Chlorine was discovered for purifying water. 
And within a few decades, chlorine is being used to make bombs. Did, however, talk about some of the positive moments in history where there were very some very close moments where there were arms control agreements that looked very good. Do you maybe you could shed light on that and give us ideas on how we can how we can bring back those types of moments in history? Well, Thomas just said that we had a, a number of arms control agreements, but the whole arms control regime is being dismantled as he as he pointed out. But the point is that. Have we many times think those people sitting in Kremlin or White House or whatever equivalent of that in Beijing, they are so powerful that they can uh, run the world and they can manage the world. But ordinary people, ordinary citizens, have forced world leaders many times to negotiate arms control agreements. For example, Randy Fosworth in uh, United States in the 1980s. Randy Fosworth launched the freeze movement. And this freeze movement bought millions of people on the streets of New York and also at the testing sites. And the result was that in 1986, when President Reagan, who was known to be a hawkish president, met President Gorbachev, they agreed, they, first they agreed for phased elimination of all nuclear weapons. So they agreed for the abolition of nuclear weapons. But, but then the Strategic Defense Initiative uh, absolutely, stopped Kishina. it. So then the Strategic Defense Initiative or the Star Wars uh, came in the way. And Reagan was very fond of Star Wars. And uh, Gorbachev was uh, totally opposed to Star Wars, uh, to put it simply. And, and so that agreement fell through. But the point is that the freeze movement, uh, just ordinary people on the streets of New York and of Kazakhstan, they, 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 they got this agreement through. Uh, you have. Uh, now, earlier today, uh, I met Daniel uh, Hoxta from uh, International Coalition for the uh, Abolition of Nuclear Weapons. Again, a number of, uh, I don't know if he's there. Uh, uh, oh, he's there. Yeah. So again, uh, uh, Daniel uh, uh, and many people like him, they, they drew a movement which forced the powers of the world to adopt this uh, treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. And that happened in 2017. It's not been endorsed by exactly those who should endorse it, but that's the next phase. Similarly, even though the abolition of nuclear weapons not achieved in the Reykjavik summit, you had subsequently a number of other agreements. So in 1980s, there were 60,000 uh, uh, nuclear warheads, and now they're down to 10,000. Uh, due to because of a number of treaties which came into which were signed in the 1990s, st so, st so so an ordinary citizen can be powerful. You have the same example, Jody Williams. Uh, uh, she uh, was a 35-year-old uh, young American woman, highly determined, uh, but, but not uh, having any political background. And she drove this entire campaign for banning landmines. And you have a treaty for, for the, uh, she launched a campaign for the banning landmines, and then now you have a treaty for the banning landmines. So, so landmines have been banned. Cluster munitions have been banned 10 years later. Landman ban took place in 1997. Cluster munitions have been banned 2007. So there are many examples of how uh, arms control agreements, or in fact, arms elimination agreements, have been uh, forced on the leaders by ordinary citizens. And I don't want to undermine the significance of some of the leaders also. People like Willy Brand, Mikhail Gorbachev, Ronald Reagan after he saw the movies. Uh, and, not and, before. And which but, three movies? You have to mention the three movies so well, everybody Ronald Reagan changed his mind that. after seeing the movies. I wish a lot of movie actors would become present. Then maybe we could make movies and solve the problems to, uh, of arms race. But one of them was The Day After, uh, which came out in the 1980s. And it had, uh, in 1980s, it had some 200 million viewers. It was produced by NBC or ABC, one of the uh, television companies in the in the US. And, and this shows... Uh, uh, what happens the day after a hypothetical uh, nuclear war takes place between the US and uh, Soviet Union at that time? Uh, you can say Russia today. But today, if you have to remake that movie, it would be very different. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Ambassador Gramminger, how do you see the problems arising from new delivery systems, especially hypersonic missiles <laughs> and lethal autonomous weapons or, or so-called killer robots? Yeah, I think we have uh, already, uh, uh, both of us alluded uh, uh, to it. I think uh, uh, this clearly opens up uh, a whole range of new risks. Uh, 
And uh, I think they, they need to be factored in. And, and for the time being, we don't really see um, um, beyond uh, individual states uh, you know, uh, trying to exploit these uh, technologies uh, that does not seem to be a, a, a decisive um, uh, commitment to deal uh, with these uh, new risks uh, uh, in a uh, nuclear risk reduction uh, framework, right? And uh, here, of course, you have the additional complication that uh, basically um, the, the war has led to uh, uh, a massive setback in in, in uh, talking about nuclear risk reduction generally in an NPT framework, but also very specifically upon the P5. Uh, it has basically, uh, you know, P5 discussions on, 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 on higher levels have uh, basically been suspended. Uh, they uh, fortunately are still taking place or have been resumed uh, on, uh, on a more technical uh, level. That is positive, but for the Time being, what we are hearing is, you know, that the sheer resumption is, uh, you know, noted to be positive, but I think we are still far from really, uh, you know, expanding the agenda, uh, and I think that is uh, what uh, would be needed, and 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 that is, by the way, uh, you know, why we have launched this uh, P5 expert dialogue. Um, where we look into uh, uh, the linkages between uh, nuclear arms and emerging technologies, and in particular artificial intelligence. And as you know, and uh, some of the experts are sitting in the audience uh, uh, this afternoon, uh, we will uh, move into the second round uh, of these conversations uh, late uh, this afternoon. Uh, tonight and tomorrow. Uh, that is the reason why we have launched uh, uh, this dialogue process to sensitize, uh, but also to come up with uh, ideas for concrete uh, risk reduction uh, uh, measures that then uh, could be taken up uh, and, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, rather sooner than later. Thank which is, which is, by the way, not to say you know that I'm not very much in in favour you know of these much broader uh, uh, um, efforts to uh, take us to a, a final uh, full abolition of nuclear arms. I mean, I'm, this is also my vision, but I think between here and then. Um, uh, I think it is wise uh, to work on, on, on risk reduction, and, uh, and, and, and that's what we are committed to. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Dr. Waslakar, you quoted Albert Einstein, uh, who you described, uh, who had described nationalism as a disease. He argued that it is the measles of mankind. You also mentioned another great thinker, an Indian poet, uh, Nobel laureate Rabindranath Tagore. And he talked about uh, the cult of nationalism, that it could cause su sudden and violent death of nations. Nationalism has become a cult that is hard to tame. Is it possible to create a healthy nationalism that can be normalized and that could discredit war? Christina. <laughs> you, you have to. I will take this again, yes. Uh, Krishna, uh, I was in Kiev before the war, just before the war, just a few. I'm sure a few of you here have been to Kiev. If you go to St. Andrew's Church in downtown Kiev and come down on a street called Andrishki Descent, it's about 700 meters. And on Sunday morning, before the war, what you would see is uh, old people in their 70s and 80s sitting there on the footpath, shivering in the cold, having blankets on them, but also blankets in front of them on tables, and selling what? selling military insignia, uh, insignia, the military medals from the Second World War. 
So these people in their 70s and 80s are the children of the soldiers who fought for Soviet Union, who were Ukrainians, but then the identity, national identity of Ukraine then was Soviet Union. And, and, and they fought against uh, Nazi Germany. And the military uniforms or the labels or the insignia, whatever they collected in their family, this is the family uh, treasure. Now their children who are old are selling it for how much? Two euros, three euros, five euros. So once upon a time, these young men wore unity, uh, military uniforms. They wore these medals with great pride. Pride in what? Nationalism. And this nationalism is on sale on the streets of Kiev for three euros. That is the value of nationalism. If you take nationalism too far, you may kill people today, you may kill people tomorrow, but 50 years from now, your nationalism will be on sale for three euros or four euros on the streets. That's nationalism. Thank and you. I thought of all the people, and, and, and again, just give me a second. I mean, this nationalism, in 1945, Ukrainian nationalism is merged with Soviet nationalism, or with Russian nationalism. In 2023, Ukrainian nationalism and uh, Russian nationalism are on the opposite side. And you can uh, uh, see it all over the world. That uh, 50 years ago, you have one kind of nationalism. 50 years later, you have another kind of nationalism. Nationalism is split. It is divided. It is merged. I mean, nationalism is the most bogus, transient uh, concept, which has been made to fool the world, fool the people. Just as religion was the opium of the masses till the 17th century, nationalism has become the new opium. You, you talked about, in your book, how it is possible to mobilize support for a war machine in the national interest to restore past glory, establish justice for perceived historical wrongs, and for the illusion of creating a great nation. Is it possible for strong men and women to mobilize for war, or do you think the opposite is also possible and true? Is it possible for great leaders to popularize the ethics of peace? Well, I believe in one thing. Weapons, even though we have accumulated thousands of them, do not start wars. Men do. I would say men and women do, but it's mostly the men who do. War starts in the minds of the men. Weapons are only the instruments. Weapons don't start war on their own. It's men who do. And war is a matter of choice. If you see the history of last 5,000 years recorded history of warfare, the first war was fought in uh, uh, what is today Iraq, uh, between Uma and Lagash. These were the two kingdoms. And this war was fought in 2500 BC something. I, I mean, I may be wrong about 100 years here or there. And ever since then, up to the current wars, wars have always been calculated decisions. It's a choice made by somebody. So war is a matter of choice. And there are leaders who may choose not to make a war. And there are leaders who may choose to make a war. So if war is a matter of choice, so can peace be. So it's your choice. You can make a, you can make a, make a uh, war as a choice, or you can make peace as a choice. But it's, leaders are not op operating in isolation. Leaders are operating uh, with support of uh, the masses, right from Peloponnesian wars. The historians of Peloponnesian wars are blaming the masses, not the leaders. But how are the minds of the masses poisoned? Don't the leaders play a role? So there is a circular relationship between the way leaders think and the masses think. Even in the most democratic societies, the, the, or in the other dictatorial societies, whatever the societies. So there is this circular relationship. And there, again, it's nationalism which is used as a glue, as just as religion was. So uh, strong leaders, weak leaders, they can make wars. Strong leaders, weak leaders, they can make peace. But there is good news. In this uh, apparently uh, dark picture, 
Out of 193 countries on the roll call of the United Nations, 23 countries have given up armies and defense and uh, ministries of defense and uh, soldiers and everything. 23 countries do not have any kind of military. They do not have weapons. They do not have military, military men. 23 countries. So the leaders of 23 countries have consistently, over the last several decades, decided not even to have arms, not even to have military. Out of 193 countries, majority of the countries, that is 123 countries, decided in 2017 to endorse the treaty for the prohibition of nuclear weapons. 123 countries out of 193 countries. And I'll give you another good news. Out of 193 countries in the world, 170 countries have a defense expenditure of less than $1 billion. So these $2 trillion defense expenditure, this marriage of artificial intelligence and nuclear weapons, this force of nationalism, all of this is a game played by the 25 countries in the world, and they are taking 7 billion, 8 billion people for ransom. And the rest of us are allowing it to happen. It's a shame. It's a shame on 8 billion people that we are allowing a few million people to take us for a ride, take us for a ride to collective suicide. But, but we are here in Geneva. It's the city of diplomacy, the heart of IHL, the home of the ICRC. And we even have here um, former secretary generals of the UN here in, in this room today. So we are, we are worried about the path to global peace. We don't seem to be able to move the, the move forward. And we are especially struck by the daily reports on the humanitarian catastrophes that we see unfolding every day in our neighboring Ukraine. We just had a panel uh, 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 a couple weeks ago with the, the angels on earth, the Médecins Sans Frontières and, and Geneva Call and other organizations that are trying to stop this humanitarian catastrophe. But how can we harness the, the power of global public opinion, especially here in Geneva, and move this grassroots movement of peace forward uh, to help really mobilize people to, towards peace? What are some of your thoughts? This is a beautiful question. And I have an answer and an appeal to luminaries like Thomas Griminger, Michael Moeller, and so many other people who are uh, sitting in this room. It's you who are the hope for the world. But how do you realize this hope? Uh, here is a way. First, we have to be clear about our objectives, what we want. I mentioned two, three kinds of agreements we want. We want phased elimination of all weapons of mass destruction in a time-bound manner. We want a new treaty to control the misuse of new technologies, especially with regards to, uh, with regards to weapons of mass destruction. We need. Uh, uh, we need a crisis response mechanism in the United Nations. United Nations organization, in effect, has become United Governments organization. It's become a forum for negotiating national interest. And United Nations Security Council is a reactive institution which is reacting after some conflict takes place in South Sudan or Nairobi or uh, uh, Mongolia, or I don't know, wherever. But, but it doesn't have a capacity to respond to civilizational crisis. So we need a crisis, civilizational crisis response mechanism. And we need a new conflict resolution machinery. And I'm coming to Geneva in a minute. And we need a new conflict resolution machinery to resolve conflicts between big powers, because UN Security Council is ineffective. The International Court of Justice is ineffective. The big powers do not yield to it. Now, to bring about this agenda, we need a third Hague conference. The first Hague conference took place in 1899 to, to reform the world and to make the first ever attempt for demilitarization. The second Hague conference took place in 1907, again with an with effort to create conflict resolution machinery and and, and that is how the Permanent Court of Arbitration came into existence and also to demilitarize. Third Hague Conference has not happened. 
and Geneva can host the third Hague Conference. <laughs> so Geneva can be the venue of the third Hague Conference. Maybe it can become the first Geneva Conference to create a world without war. Well, the first thing is we have to change the name. So <laughs> no, so so instead of like third Hague Conference, it can be the 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 first Geneva Conference as a as a, as a sequel to the second, so the sequel to the second Hague conference can be the third, first Geneva conference. So from two, we go back one, to go back to one. But Geneva, <coughs> you call it first, second, third, whatever. But the point is that Geneva can, can emerge as a, as a moral force, as a mobilizer of mor moral force. This is a city where you have negotiations taking place between nation states in the premises, precincts of the United Nations. But this is a city which has also provided a provided lot of, lot of uh, moral capital to the world. And one of the examples is that broken chair, not too far from here. So the civil society, the diplomacy, the international Geneva, the national Geneva, the, the financial capital, all of that can come together and, and uh, mobilize the moral force. And there, is, there are enough ingredients. Do you have 23 countries without uh, armies? You have 123 countries wanting to get rid of weapons of mass destruction. So, so there is, you have to pick up the positive elements, ingredients which are there, but then you need a catalyst. And today it is not Hague, but it is Geneva which can be that catalyst. And I hope Geneva will be. Thank you so much. As the former Secretary General of the OSC, what are your political strategies, Ambassador Greminger, for ensuring the survival of humankind? And what can be done in the political sphere to transfer diplomacy and global security? These are the kind of questions you have after you've read this book. And I highly encourage all of you to read it. Yeah, that's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I very much, uh, and, and you will also understand why I like this uh, vision, uh, uh, your call uh, to shift from confrontation to cooperation and compassion. I think uh, that is, uh, and, and uh, uh, this uh, concept of moving from the choice of war to the choice of, of peace. And in a way, I also find uh, uh, your idea of uh, aiming at a third Hague conference intriguing. Uh, obviously, for me, the big question is uh, how to get from here <laughs> in a super polarized uh, world uh, that is uh, basically uh, almost exclusively dominated by uh, uh, deterrence thinking uh, to uh, uh, to preparing uh, a third Hague conference, I do believe uh, that uh, indeed, uh, you know, uh, international Geneva can contribute. I think is also uh, 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 trying to contribute, uh, including small uh, and modest outfits like the GCSB, you know, by offering a protected space uh, for dialogue. Uh, there, are, you know, uh, also people that don't share uh, views. Uh, the, the same uh, um, uh, political um, views can can gather a uh, uh, talk and and perhaps agree on a way forward. Um, but um, you know, uh, trying to do it uh, a bit in a bigger way. I think the organization that I worked for, the OEC, uh, tried that through uh, what. Um, it's called cooperative security. So, uh, you know, try to tackle common security challenges instead uh, of by confrontational means, by cooperation. It sounds very simple, and in a way, it is, it is also uh, quite simple. And you don't even need to share values to uh, go down uh, that path. But at the same time, as you know, that uh, you know, this concept uh, has uh, had a, a relatively uh, good track record for a, a couple of decades. Uh, but lately, it has also been very much on the mind, and its institutions uh, have been put in question. And um, f frankly, uh, many of us have not been thinking about a third Hague conference, but. 
uh, much rather how could we take advantage of the 50th anniversary of the Helsinki Final Accord and, and try to kind of reinvigorate, you know, uh, some of uh, the principles of European security, some of uh, the commitments that had, uh, have been developed over the last uh, 40 years. Um, I think, that, again, there is a piece of good news out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is a lot of good things, uh, a lot of uh, uh, good principles and commitments, but I think they have just been violated massively lately. Uh, and uh, we have uh, clearly uh, lost a common understanding of, of what these principles uh, would uh, mean today in the 21st century, and in particular after the 24th of uh, February 2022. So I would uh, advocate as, uh, as a step, as a stage towards HX3, uh, let's uh, try to reinvigorate, uh, bring back some sense uh, of cooperative security to the European security order. But again, this is uh, you know uh, a very tall order as long as you have an ongoing high-intensity war, and so I would argue again realistically, uh, we can we should start thinking about how to go about uh, such a process now, but politically this will most likely only be possible if uh, we have reached uh, uh, the end of the war and hopefully uh, 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 a negotiated end of the war on which one could try to reconstruct uh, a new European and to an extent also global security order. <coughs> So, I mean, I'm, I'm all fine with take three. <laughs> I would advocate to go about it incrementally. Perhaps just to push you a little bit on this um, promotion of cooperative security and dialoguing, what efforts are you currently engaged in here at the GCSP? I know there's a lot going on, or perhaps you don't or can't tell us exactly uh, what you're doing, but I think it would be interesting for our global audience to understand exactly cooperative security here in, uh, at the GCSP. What does it look like? Well, th this is uh, uh, at the heart of cooperative security is dialogue. Uh, dialogue is uh, uh, at the outset of any uh, meaningful cooperation. And even, you know, if, even if, uh, if you have a violent conflict ongoing, if you have a war ongoing, you need some elements uh, of, uh, or you better have some elements uh, uh, of cooperative security. Uh, and here, I, you know, I would think of uh, crisis communication channels, uh, uh, you know, uh, deconfliction de uh, channels that allow you to kind of uh, at least prevent on it intended uh, escalations and, and I think we have this uh, today only in a uh, uh, unsatisfactory uh, to an unsatisfactory extent so I think this is clearly something that uh, we are also trying to work on um, you have uh, been reading uh, the the, the, the news, the media, so you know that we have a back channel. We've been working on, uh, you know, status and, and security guarantee issues. We've been working on ceasefire monitoring mechanisms. So uh, we have uh, tried to conduct dialogue uh, that uh, would, could produce answers uh, to the war as such. But also, uh, the war has led to a suspension of conversations on many extremely important security issues. Uh, you know, starting with uh, nuclear arms, there, has, there is hardly any uh, serious government-to-government uh, -government, uh, dialogue ongoing. We just, you know, referred to uh, P5 experts talking again. Uh, that, that's great. Um, but here as well, we offer spaces. Uh, um, but also on, on, you know, on, on complicated geographies, uh, there is no official uh, dialogue anymore. Uh, here we cannot replace uh, a lack of official dialogue, um, but we can uh, at least provide some alternatives. Uh, uh, we do that, for instance, on, 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 on Syria. We're going to have uh, next week uh, 
uh, a, a meeting of top experts, uh, both American and Russians, on, on, on Syria here. Um, we work on the Arctic. I think we are one of the last uh, uh, platforms where all key stakeholders uh, for the Arctic have a space uh, to talk to each other. So these are some examples, you know, where we try to, to kind of uh, um, promote a dialogue. Um, but I've, of course, this is all uh, super, super mini contributions uh, to the kind of uh, vision that Sandeep outlines in his, uh, his book. I'm aware of that. I, I think you're being too modest, but uh, we did have a, a, a also a tabletop exercise at the Munich Security Conference where we worked with the George C. Marshall Center and uh, Harvard University on negotiating the non-negotiable uh, mapping a ceasefire agreement with uh, Russia. So that was um, um, trying to think, think forward on how we can do that. So. Dr. Wesley in your book, you take one step further about advocating for not just a nuclear free world, but you're calling for complete disarmament world, disbanding armed forces, eliminating stockpiles of weapons, even ab the abolition of organizations like NATO uh, that are meant to be security frameworks. Um, how, how do you foresee this? How can you, can you elaborate on what your vision is of this? How can we move forward on this? Is this even feasible? In, uh, in 1955, Albert Einstein and Brussels uh, and Bertrand Russell issued Russell Einstein Manifesto. And they said, you have a choice. Either you be ready for the end of human race, or you renounce war. There is nothing in between. Maybe there is something in between for a few decades. But, but beyond that, it will be either the end of human race or you have to renounce war. In 2019, in the Normandy Manifesto for World Peace, when these Nobel Peace laureates and social thinkers, we got together, we reiterated that. That either, either you uh, make a choice of slowly, not overnight, but in an incremental, gradual fashion, slowly move away from the, from the infrastructure of war, from the mentality of war, to infrastructure of cooperation and dialogue. So this has to happen in a, in a phased way. And this is not something that's going to happen uh, overnight. You know, who first thought about the United Nations? Can you imagine when was United Nations conceived and by whom? United Nations was conceived by a European scholar called Emery Crusay in 1623, not in 1943. Then in 1798, you had Immanuel Kant, who proposed Federation of States. And in 1916, you had Mahatma Gandhi, who proposed another concept of United Nations. And in all these concepts from Emery Crusade to Emmanuel Kant to Mahatma Gandhi, the United Nations or the Confederation of States or the Federation of States they had proposed was based on equality of nations and reduction of armament. So this thought has been moving since 1623, today it is 2023 for the last 400 years. And it has not succeeded so far, but we don't have to give up. Because if we give up this thought, we'll have to give up on humanity. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I applaud all of you for coming here over lunch to be with us. So I'd really like to hear your thoughts and your ideas on, on um, this book. And hopefully uh, you will uh, read it, or, 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 or uh, if you have read it, uh, elaborate on it. Um, so we will start a Q&A session now. Please note that this is a public discussion. The Q&A might uh, be um, posted on social media. So if you do not wish to give your name or position, uh, you can refrain from introducing yourself. But we would like to know who you are uh, if you want to introduce yourself. So please, you have the floor. 
I have a gentleman, gentleman behind you. Blue shirt. So, uh, you can just talk freely. Okay. We can all hear you. No problem. Yes. My name is Jonathan Granoff. I'm a fellow and a trustee in the World Academy of Art and Science that was created by Bertrand Russell and Albert Einstein, uh, and Joseph Rotblatt, I might add. Um, I'm also the president of the Global Security Institute, and I represent the summit of the Nobel Peace Laureates at the United Nations. I want to come in behind you and just point out that we really don't need to reinvent the wheel. Chapter 5, Article 26 of the Charter of the United Nations says the Security Council shall, not might or may, it's not a resolution, shall convene the military staff committees to reduce arms expenditures to free up resources for development. That's in the Charter. It's the international law. It's not something that could be vetoed. It's actually a duty that remains unfulfilled. I want to point out that the nations of the world have negotiated those incremental steps that you talked about in 1995 to gain the indefinite extension of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. A set of commitments were made. Test ban treaty, fissile material cutoff treaty, weapons of mass destruction free zone in the Middle East, 2013 practical steps to walk down the ladder. 2010, 60 more commitments. The diplomats were operating in good faith arguing for strategic stability as we walk down the ladder. But when they went back to their capitals, the military said, no, these are mere political commitments. Diplomats, thank you so much for your suggestions. We're interested in military advantage. And thus, since 2000, the world has spent over $32 trillion in military expenditures and a mere pittance to fulfill the Millennium Development Goals and the Sustainable Development Goals. I would contend that when diplomats make these commitments, they're operating in good faith. They go back to their capitals. Pacta San Servanda is ignored because national militarism dominates the discussion. It seems to me that first and foremost, diplomats have to make the case in their capitals that promises that have been made must be kept. And in order to do that, we need a framework of how security can be obtained based on planetary realism, our common humanity. Because nations cannot practice, protect us from pandemics, protect the climate, protect the oceans, protect the rainforests at a national level. They require a vision of security <coughs> based on the opening statement of the United Nations, the peoples of the world. And I would agree with you, sir, that Nationalism, except nationalism is necessary, but it's not an end in itself. It's human security that is, and, and, the, and there's a General Assembly resolution on exactly what I've said. So all of these principles exist, but the diplomats have not made their case in the capitals because they all operate from a national security framework. If the <coughs> diplomats collectively got together and said, we want our commitments to be fulfilled, I think that would be a very big step. Thank you so much. And was there a question somewhere hidden in all that? Oh, yes, comments on well, how, do we move from, how do we move to a human security framework? There is a human security for all project in the UN right now, but it's very much on the margins. How do we get to realism and human security? Who would like to begin? I, uh, I, it's, it's easy to put the blame on, on, on diplomats that are not capable to make their case in, <laughs> back home. But I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, diplomats would argue we need political leadership uh, in our capitals. And, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, we can, we can uh, progress and implement all these uh, principles and commitments that uh, we have been uh, agreeing to over the last uh, few decades. So uh, I think uh, what uh, what uh, I, I think I miss currently is is this political determination, uh, and and frankly, in particular, I mean, we have heard about ICANN uh, that you know ma managed uh, to uh, put up a lot of uh, uh, political momentum uh, that uh, made the TPNW uh, a reality. But I think what we haven't seen. Uh, in recent years is a similar momentum in P5 states. And, and I think if we uh, want to advance uh, uh, 
uh, then we also need to have uh, um, you know, a, a similar uh, momentum and, and bottom-up pressure in, in P5 states. Uh, um, but, but, but this said, you know, I, I think we see uh, issues when it comes to um, uh, uh, an eroding arms control system, not only in the nuclear uh, area. I've been uh, mainly working uh, in the conventional uh, area uh, in the last uh, 10 years, and uh, the, the picture is similarly bleak, right? And there hasn't been uh, much... Basically, arms control has not been on the political agenda uh, in the last uh, years. Uh, uh, you haven't had politicians around that felt, you know, uh, that matters, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, a platform on which I want to uh, be elected. I mean, th this simply wasn't the case anymore. In a way, you know, security was also taken for granted, particularly here in Europe. Uh, so, uh, while during the Cold War you have politicians that were elected because they were considered to be security policy experts. <laughs> this is not the case anymore. And, uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, I think this concern for peace and security, you know, has uh, again to become um, uh, a political mainstream uh, uh, concern. And, uh, you know, as we had it, there, were, there are moments, and, and uh, Sandeep describes moments in history where this happened and uh, where this fomented uh, 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 a, a political dynamic then, that led then to, to outcomes. Uh, but for, for the time being, I don't sense that. Thank you. Would you like to add something for this? No, I, I fully agree with uh, Thomas that it's not just diplomats. You have to have political will, and you have to have political uh, political leaders to mobilize that, uh, mobilize the public opinion and public to mobilize political opinion. But in addition to the list of uh, 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 treaties and uh, laws that exist that Jonathan Granoff mentioned, I would say that there is an unanimous resolution of UN General Assembly passed in 1960 calling for general and complete disarmament. So when you earlier asked the question, it's not just nuclear disarmament, but it's a general... Com there is a UN, UN General Assembly unanimous resolution. So you already have a manifesto in the form of an unanimous resolution of the General Assembly. And I have given the details of the resolution number. And, and this was negotiated by Khrushchev and, uh, and Kennedy in the middle of uh, the height of one of the moments of the height of the Cold War. So, so there is a lot of legal infrastructure which is there. Uh, but what you really need is a political will. And maybe, maybe what can possibly uh, one can hope for is the rise of few political leaders who take up this challenge. It's only then it is possible. Uh, but until you, uh, and, and, and the political leaders will rise if they see a dividend in the political market. Currently, nationalism is on the rise because they see a, a dividend in the political market for nationalism, for, for hatred, for uh, the creating mistrust. So you need, you need the political leaders and you need the political mar market that, that pays for peace and sustainability. You, you talked about changing cultural and social change, and I think the book is something that also young people should have access to and, and children. So we're, we were talking about making this version for, <laughs> for youth and young people and perhaps you get UNESCO behind it. Uh, to to help young people read about this book. Um, so uh, there was another question. Yes, please go ahead. Yes. Thank you. I'm Michel Molo uh, um, from an NGO, International Fellowship of Reconciliation. And uh, I have a question to our friend from India, uh, here of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, do you think it's possible now, under the circumstances that we have such deadly weapons to come back to a civil defense, civil nonviolent defense. Has it had been experimented during the Second World War by Denmark, for example, and uh, during the uh, Soviet occupation by Lithuania and Czechoslovakia? Do you think it's now uh, the moment to come to just give an alternative to war with this international nonviolent civilian defense, 
to really think it's possible. Now the time has come for this. Well, you asked two different questions. Is it possible or, and has the time come for this? If it is, is it possible, politically speaking, it is not possible right now. But is it desirable? Yes. But the, the I mean, I have mentioned already 23 countries don't have weapons and armies. So these countries are making alternative arrangements for their security, including the civilian uh, defense. But the problem arises with the big powers, the, the big 20, 25 countries. They don't want to give up their weapons. And until they do it, uh, nothing is going to happen. In some of, those, some of the other countries, it might be possible. But on a global stage, today the time has not come. And I don't know how, what will bring that time. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe a limited uh, nuclear war might open people's eyes. But I don't think there is anything like a nuclear, limited nuclear war. A limited nuclear war will Im immediately snowball into a into a full-scale nuclear war in a matter of few hours. So, so I don't know what's going to open people's eyes. I really don't have an answer uh, to that. Uh, until we find an answer to that, what we can do is to create a soft infrastructure of ideas and spread those ideas. So soft infrastructure of ideas, has that infrastructure has to be stronger than the hard infrastructure of military. So that is what we have to, and my book is a contribution to create this soft infrastructure of ideas. By the way, the book is published by HarperCollins, but unfortunately, it's available only in India for various legal reasons. Uh, we hope it will be available internationally, but there will be a French edition available uh, at the end of the year uh, in all the French-speaking uh, parts of the world, including Geneva. So, at the end of the year, you can get it in bookstores in uh, Geneva in French, not in English. I, I think La Franco Francophonie will be happy uh, to hear that. Yes. Uh -huh. um, I, I will uh, now open the floor for more questions. Yes, please. Can I ask one? Um, thank you very much. I'm Alexandra Matas from GCSP. Thank you for your book, Sandeep. I read it with a lot of interest. I have one question. We discussed now uh, who influences whom about the public opinion, you know, the political leadership, what's the role of media? You know, we, we heard that how, how much uh, public um, support uh, was against the war in Vietnam, which, which was in a way constructed by the coverage of the war by media. They, I don't personally see the role of media in uh, attracting you know, attention to the concerns of the survival of humanity on nuclear risks, this narrative doesn't exist, at least in the Western media. So why is this the case today, and can media play a role? Of course, media is extremely important. It's perhaps one of the most important catalysts to, to transform minds in today's world. And uh, Ronald Reagan's mind was changed to some extent by the media, by three movies which he saw. So the media is not just the newspapers and social media and uh, WhatsApp and, uh, but media is also movies, media is also music. There is a, the, the, there have been some music groups which are made. We talked about Bob Geldof. Yes, you talk Bob Geldof. Uh, uh, there, there are some music groups which, which I have dis discussed them in my book. Uh, they made the concept of mega death very well known. So uh, in the 1950s and 60s, when the mm, Cold War uh, started escalating, uh, people started talking about mega death, not death. So death wouldn't matter anymore. So one million death is equal to one mega death. And this concept was made popular by a music group. So media is very important. And media, it has to be some enlightened people in the media who can, who can uh, literally light the candle. And that's one hope. Uh, and the politicians respond to the media. If they see that, that uh, they will get a positive response from the media, they will uh, change their view. I mean, pol many politicians are out there in the market. They are war, manger, war, war mongers because they think they can benefit from war. If they think they can benefit from peace, they will become the, uh, the biggest advocates of peace. A Lot of the politicians are there for power. They are neither there for war nor there are for peace. They have no conviction. 
Thank you. You 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 also mentioned um, multi-stakeholder approaches. So looking at government, civil society, but always the private sector. Uh, to 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 be completely frank, we can see that the private sector, especially, is making millions, if not trillions, now on these wars. So what how we can can get them to to change their practices and 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 look at 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 the world in a much more humane perspective. Last week, I had one of the most uh, despairing moments in my life when, in fact, Thomas and I were sitting in the same room in, uh, in New Delhi. And this was a conference uh, on international affairs, a big one. And there was a representative of a private sector. And he stood up to speak. And he said, oh, we are just about to enter this beautiful era of hypersonic missiles. and." Artificial intelligence to be used for weapons. We don't have to use uh, conventional weapons anymore. And we have to put all energy and all investment in, in using artificial intelligence and, and cyber technology uh, to create these this, this massive weapons. And he was saying it with so much of pride. That's part of the private sector for you. I'm not saying all of the private sector is like that, but that's part of the private sector. He was saying with pride in, in the front of 2,000 people. And so when you think of the solutions, you can say there may be elements in the media. You can think of elements in civil society. You can even think of elements in the political system. It's a lot more difficult to think of elements in the private sector, though I won't write it off. I mean, I, there have to be some enlightened people in the private sector as well. Thank you. Uh, we have still time for questions, so please, uh, if you have a question or a comment or an idea, uh, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, Mario Carrera, I'm uh, retired from the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. We work together on the Middle East with uh, Sandeep and it's about water issue and so on. Now, my question is about peace moment, but you, you say in the, in the Normandy Manifesto, you said something important. We have a tendency to establish peace only after a prolonging, devastating war. And I think Ukraine is a devastating war for Europe, and not only for Europe, for the world. Now, my question is how to take the opportunity, an opportunity to develop a, a peace movement in the world, because we have a green movement in the world. Huh? But the, uh, after Paris, uh, maybe also before Paris uh, upcoming, but the Green Movement was a movement, idealistic movement, but also a movement of, uh, of preoccupation because to, to fear uh, against uh, pollution and so on. But peace now could be also a movement where we say it's a, it's a huge opportunity to establish peace because we are afraid. Because at the moment before Ukraine, at least in Europe, we, we, we were not thinking about peace. It was, a, it, it was a, a, about war. It was a peace situation in Europe and maybe in all the world. So no, no idea, no reason to have a peace movement because uh, the, the tensions was not established. Now, with Ukraine, there is a tension, there is a devastating war. How can we mobilize a world movement, not only in Europe? Thank you so much. And I think I missed somebody on this side, I was told. Is there was a question? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, hi there, Zach Pakin. I'm with SEPS in Brussels and the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy in North America. Um, in the absence of political will for a ceasefire or confidence building measures or even peace building in the context of, of Ukraine, we have seen the emergence of two visions globally. One, which is found mostly in the West, in which basically the, the prevailing view is we need to respond to what appears to be a clear-cut violation of international law, a cardinal violation of international law in the form of aggression, and that requires mobilizing military equipment and the like uh, to Ukraine's side in order to resist um, a deliberate act of war. And the other vision appears to be put forward by the likes of India, which appear to be sitting on the sidelines and um, you know, playing all sides of the equation, looking after their own interests. And I'm wondering, in your view, um, which one of those two approaches, in the absence of a much better peace-building approach, which one of those two visions has the least deleterious impact on the international order? Which one of those two approaches is more in line with your vision of trying to bring about uh, a world without war? 
you for both those questions. Please, who would like to start? You want to pass? Well, I, I think every crisis, uh, 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 you know, can also be seized as an opportunity. Uh, um, but, uh, f frankly, uh, as long as uh, this uh, war is, is ongoing, and then also uh, given, you know, the very clear-cut perceptions, uh, who, uh, you know, is the aggressor, who is the aggressed, uh, I don't see this happening now, uh, because uh, uh, if you were to... Uh, Launch. I mean, you have seen it, you know, by these so-called peace manifestations, for instance, in, in, in Berlin, but also in, in parts of Switzerland. Uh, uh, these groups have uh, immediately uh, been stigmatized uh, as, uh, you know, being uh, politically naive, uh, basically implicitly or explicitly favoring the ag aggressor. So I think it, it, this is not going to happen now. Um, if we are uh, lucky enough to come to a negotiated end of the war, that is perceived to be uh, acceptable by key stakeholders. I think this could create an environment where, you know, what clearly has, uh, has uh, that the war has uh, clearly, again, created a lot of uh, sensitivity for well, the risk of violent conflict in Europe. Uh, after the end of the Cold War, we, we basically thought this is uh, maybe for Africa, but not for Europe, right? Uh, so we are again sensitized. So this is an issue. Um, uh, a bit similar to what I said in the very beginning uh, about nuclear arms. This you know, fell totally off the, the mainstream political radar. Now we have had again all these nuclear saber rattling, so there is a, a, again sensitivity, and this sensitivity uh, could be exploited. Um, so I, I would say um, I'm an eternal optimist. So I, I would say in the medium term there is a, a potential to use that uh, to create a political environment that, and, and that is my vision, you know, to to recreate a European and a global security order that is not exclusively based on deterrence, that does not, again, you know, take us into a, a, an extremely costly arms race. And I mean, that's what we are currently seeing. You know, we are at the, the outset of, again, an extremely costly uh, conventional and nuclear uh, arms race. Thank you. Did you <coughs> want to add? Yeah, well, I, I fully agree with uh, Thomas on the uh, principles of cooperative society being the governing uh, principles for the world order, not just, uh, he's talking mainly in the European context, but not just for Europe, but I think we need cooperative society on a, on a global uh, basis. To answer your question uh, about Ukraine, uh, my own view is that uh, I'm totally against violation of international law. I'm totally against the killing of innocent uh, children and uh, uh, families. I'm totally against uh, destroying schools, hospitals, infrastructure, uh, all of that. Uh, and I'm totally against, uh, not on a selective basis, but on a universal basis against all these things. So whether Saudi Arabia is attacking uh, Yemen, or whether United States is attacking uh, uh, Iraq, or whether UK is attacking Syria or Iraq, or whether uh, US is attacking Libya, or whether Russia is attacking uh, uh, Ukraine, whenever there is a violation of international law and whenever there is a, uh, 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 there is a killing of innocent people, uh, we should not accept. The world should be based on certain uh, uh, principles. But these principles should not be advocated on, on, on selective basis. Where is the outrage in Europe when Saudi Arabia attacks Yemen? Where is the willingness to take your refugees from Yemen? Where is the outrage in Europe when the United States attacks Iraq or UK attacks Iraq? Where is the outrage in Europe when uh, DRC is uh, undermined by Rwanda? Why don't you have uh, refugees from DRC coming to your houses, just as the way you welcome refugees from Ukraine? So humanity is non-negotiable. And humanity is indivisible, and humanity cannot be selective. 
That's my answer. Thank you so much. Um, yes, please go ahead. Daniel Bieler, I'm a colleague of, uh, former, former, former colleague of uh, Thomas. Uh, I think we have to start by ourselves here. We are in Geneva. There are many diplomats. There were some, some people saying, speaking about diplomats. The diplomats are extremely in a favorable position. They travel, they discuss, they cause, they think. It's a fantastic job. But if they don't believe in what they do, we will have nothing for the diplomats. I agree totally that when the diplomats come home, they have to fight for what they obtain in the negotiation. And they cannot fight if they don't believe in what they were signing or in what they were preparing. In New York, those, uh, all those resolutions you mentioned were prepared by diplomats. Of course, the states, the, the government said, yes, yes, go ahead, go ahead. But the government said, OK, we don't, uh, we, we, we don't care because what's happened in New York is not uh, for us. But if the diplomats come back home and say, now we have to sign, now we have to fight, we, have, we are responsible for that. For example, two days ago, the president of Switzerland mentioned <laughs> this uh, frenesy militaire in French. Huh? There is a, 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 a translation in English. I don't remember. I don't remember. Frenesi is a lack of meanness. Military meanness around Ukraine and Russian conflicts. I think the Swiss diplomat, following the president, they have something to say. And they have to, something to say where they are. We are in Geneva. So if we express ourselves on that line, maybe some other people will follow us, will listen to us. But we have to start by ourselves. It's beautiful, those big treaties and things like this, and how to organize the world and so on. But we all have our life, and we are all, for me, able to push something if we want. And I will just underline that we have to use the youth. The youth, they, they understand much better than sometimes than us the situation in the world, they, have to, to, they know how to manage the A, uh, IA and, uh, uh, and so on. They know how to go public. They know how to go TikTok and uh, WhatsApp and so on. And we have to use them much more than we. We don't have to keep this problematic, extraordinarily important problematic, to very high level where we cannot reach them and uh, that's not our. No, we have to go down. To, to us and to the news. Uh, who would like to tackle that? Uh, I, I think we just agree with you. Um, the, the problem, the, pro the problem. Yeah, he's right. Uh, I think it, it, it is uh, true. Uh, uh, um, uh, Jean Dalil Biel, he has uh, worked uh, in very important uh, functions in the human security department of the Swiss uh, FDFA. And I, I think he's a model in that sense. He's been fighting uh, for these kinds of beliefs. That's important. You know, my only point of caution was at the end, uh, you know, you need uh, a political uh, commitment by governments. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I've seen not that much uh, recently in in particular uh, in uh, you know key stakeholders uh, uh, for european and global security uh, there has been uh, little uh, leadership little commitment uh, for peace and um, but uh, but uh, i mean uh, i i totally agree uh, with your uh, sense that you know the diplomats have to uh, have to walk the talk. They have to believe in 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 what they do. I, I highly encourage everyone to read the book. But what are your key messages that that you wanted to transmit to us from your book? Well, With your I, book, I don't want to uh, go to the key messages. I think I already related some of them. I just want to say two things. Uh, number one, we are here in Switzerland, and Switzerland. Uh, is a country which has not gone to a war for 500 years. So here is the magic of Switzerland, which can be inspiration uh, to the world. And I think we have to learn this magic in the rest of the world. And you have to tell us how to create this magic 
everywhere else. Uh, the second thing I would like to say is that uh, the cha challenges are formidable. There is no political will now. But uh, we have to create a soft infrastructure of ideas. And we have to have patience. I see all through this session of last two hours, Mega is standing all the time there in the corner without taking a seat. So that calls for a great patience, standing for two hours in a session. I, I don't know, there are empty seats, why you didn't take a chair? But, uh, <laughs> but, but we, need, we need patience at, uh, at, at all levels. We need uh, forbearance. We need uh, commitment. And we need to leave for some kind of a conviction. Thank you so much. I, I know Ambassador Griminger has to run, so I'd like to give you the floor to close this session. Um, thank you. I, I just want to say, Sandeep uh, uh, Waslerkar, it's been an amazing um, talk. Uh, you, you talked about how uh, you, your, your name means light, Sandeep. And I know here in Geneva, we call we always talk about the, the Calvinist uh, call for the Reformation was post in Ebras Lux, so after the, light, af after the dark comes the light. So thank you for being the light here in Geneva. Um, Ambassador Graminger, you have our last words. Yeah, I think there is little to add to this <laughs> conclusion by you, Christina. Uh, it's, it's, it's true, I have to run for the new agenda for peace. And uh, so, uh, but, you know, just simply thanking you, Sandeep, uh, not only for launching uh, your book here, uh, uh, on a GCSP platform that honors us, uh, but for having had the courage to write this book and to, to provide us with this vision uh, in a very gloomy world. Thank you so much. Well, thank you.